Uh, thanks very much. I want to do my presentation this morning on the evolution of CBCs as a community economic development approach. I've chosen the community business development centers as uh, my topic for the sector of discussion. The sector is small business financing and business support in rural communities. I have with me today staff of the Atlantic Association and the first executive director of the CBC, well, the CBC guide for today is Ron Ryan is with us. Um, so I'm going to uh, go through my presentation and I really focus, the first part is on some theory around community economic development. Secondly is the genesis of the CBC program itself, um, the mandate, uh, some history, some current affairs, uh, some challenges and some opportunities. The first thing I want to start with is the CBC program is premised on access to capital for small business. And access to capital is something that's very enabling. Um, it helps communities uh, in terms of provide a lot of goods and services that may or may not be available. Uh, it provides that necessary means to accomplish a great deal within, within communities. It produces measurable results. In a lot of cases, it produces some unintended positive consequences. I want to start by uh, talking about the Community Future Program itself, because that's really where the mandate for the CBC program comes from. That uh, if you look at the definition within the terms and conditions as set down by Treasury Board, they talk about the purpose of community futures, and it's defined here in the slide that is to help communities develop and implement local solutions to local problems. It has three program objectives, and they are to provide economic stability, growth, and job creation. Uh, secondly, to provide diversified and competitive rural, uh, local rural economies. And thirdly, to have economically uh, sustainable communities. So the legal framework for the Community Futures Program establishes the mandate for the, uh, for the CBCs. I'm going to talk a bit more about the actual activities that are allowed under the Community Futures Program. There's a lot of uh, words on this slide, so I'm going to try to paraphrase to a certain extent. There are four pillars to the Community Futures Program. The first is under planning, where they talk about fostering strategic community planning and socioeconomic development by working with their communities to assess local problems. So the first part of it is around planning. The second part is, the second pillar is around providing business support um, to, uh, to those that want to uh, um, start or either start a business or those that are already in a business. The third is access to financing for small business development. And the fourth pillar is around uh, projects, community projects that, that could be started within, uh, within respective communities. The parameters are very broad um, and uh, I argue very inclusive that particularly when you consider the community projects that's because they identify within the, within the wording of the program activities that uh, you can have targeted programs for youth, uh, women, for Aboriginal groups, for those that are disadvantaged. So from an overall perspective, uh, very, very broad parameters. Um, one of the things that I, that I read as part of the work uh, was um, the idea of having flexibility within the program parameters. There's a couple of gentlemen, uh, one of them, Needham and Downing, that talked about that the you know, community futures policy really should be, that whole framework should be reviewed and modified to reflect more of what the CED practices are. They argue that community futures really focuses on business development rather than the broader mandate of capacity building and planning and, and uh, so on. Those, uh, the four program activities, as I mentioned, are part of the community futures. The CDC network in Atlanta, Canada, that really only deals with two of those, uh, and that is access to financing and the business counseling and technical, technical support to, uh, to business. Those four program for, uh, uh, for activities really are used everywhere west of New Brunswick. So Quebec, Ontario, the Western provinces, and the territories uh, use the, the four components of Community Futures. There are 269 corporations across the country. Uh, we have a provincial association in each one of the provinces, and we have two regional associations. One, the Atlantic Association of CBCs in Atlantic Canada, and the second is the Pan West Association of Community Futures Groups uh, that operate in, uh, in Western Canada. Uh, we have a national network that is, that is comprised of nine provinces and two territories. Uh, Quebec is not part of that. They were part of the initial offering, uh, but in 2008 they walked away from the, from the table um, because they didn't necessarily like the direction that, that I was going in. The mandate in uh, Atlantic Canada, as I mentioned, is based on access to capital and business counseling and technical support. Guysboro, for example, um, has evolved over the years that, in, in fact, they did and have done more than just the access to capital and the business counseling and the business financing. Back in the uh, early 1990s, there was a special program that was set up um, by CEIC at the time under the Atlantic Groundfish Strategy and Tags Program. They set up a community development fund. It's a $6 million fund that allowed 
more uh, breadth, if you will, of activities that could be done in Guy's world. So uh, we've seen really the first advent around uh, social economy, where uh, some of the work that was done by the Community Development Fund allowed uh, communities to do more planning. There were feasibility studies that were carried out on different uh, development initiatives that could be undertaken. Um, there were some special initiatives, um, like the Stan Rogers Folk Festival, that was uh, initially the money to help get those guys off the ground was bridge financed by the Office of Geisbo, uh, and later uh, other monies were provided to them to, uh, to mortgage the, uh, the campground. So there's some broader things that were done in Geisbo than in uh, than other places. I'm going to stick to a little bit of, of the theory part um, to make sure we cover that off. And one of the discussions within the community economic development world is whether or not the initiative that you're involved with, whether it's targeted versus place-based development, and I argue that the CBC model is a combination of place-based uh, approach to CED and it is targeted development. I say that it's, it's uh, place-based because of the geographic territory that's covered by the individual CBCs. They have a defined territory that uh, basically says you work within these confines. For Geisel, for example, it stretches from the Cancel Causeway down to Cancel over along the eastern shore up as far as Halifax County and then across to Picta County and touches on Anacunish County. So it's a very broad uh, territory that they have to cover, but it's also targeted because you have specific programs that are available for uh, women, for youth, uh, for those with, uh, with disabilities and so on. So it's a combination of both. The, in the broader context of the CDCs within Atlanta, Canada, our focus is rural Atlanta, Canada. We do not have offices in Halifax or Moncton or Charlottetown or Fredericton or St. John or St. John's um, Newfoundland. Um, so uh, we see it as being both uh, a target-based uh, approach and a place-based uh, approach. Moving on to a bit more theory around the uh, vers liberal versus progressive development. Um, and there's some clinical definitions around each of those. And they talk about a liberal approach involves business development or employment development. That's exactly what CBCs do, uh, and it's, it's particularly where they started. Uh, it was to assist with the plight of the unemployed and underemployed uh, in the Geisborough region. And one of the ways they did that was through small business development. The early model provided a lot of hand-holding to help businesses get started. Uh, businesses like Sunny the wood, Woodcrackers, uh, Little Dover Boat Builders, uh, Blue Ribbon Co-op. Uh, some of those initiatives were really nurtured by the, uh, the group back in the, uh, the mid-1970s. They worked on some experimental projects back at that time, uh, a charcoal project in terms of taking hardwood and converting it into charcoal as a, an alternative burning source. They looked at some concepts around solar energy back in the mid-1970s. So they say a liberal approach is more focused on business development. Um, secondly, that it's re usually initiated by either government or a chamber of commerce or some type of local uh, non-profit group. Well, in fact, the CBCs fill that role within that. Contrary to that, or, or uh, one of the other approaches is a, conserv a uh, progressive approach. And they say within that approach, it's both about small business development, but it's also about community capacity building. It's also about planning for the long term. And uh, I'd argue that the model that was established in Guysboro in the mid-1970s has actually morphed in to the Community Future Program of today. So I see it really as being uh, maybe in a lot of senses liberal, but it also has a very progressive approach, especially when you look at it in terms of the role that businesses play within community economic development that they identify really five roles of business. Uh, one is helping people in poverty get out of poverty, uh, creating jobs in the community, sponsoring and supporting activities in the community which contribute to the quality of life in the community. They contribute to the vibrancy of a community, especially those businesses that are local and their funds and money is staying within the, uh, within the community. And lastly, that they're socially responsible. The CBC's role is to assist with small business development. So in terms of if you have businesses established in your community, then the role that they play in the community has been supported by the work that's done by, uh, by CDCs. Next, I want to focus on the CD, CED approach and whether or not it's an effective approach to community economic development. It's really driven by, as the mandate uh, from, for the Community Futures Program talks about, is developing local solutions to local problems. If you look at David Douglas's work, um, uh, he talks about a definition of community economic development as being development by the community, for the community. Um, so in essence, that's the same thing that we're doing with the Community Futures Program. If you look at, uh, I mentioned before, the Stan Rogers Folk Festival, that's an example of the community identifying something that could help the community. It was developed by the community, supported by the community, 
it's still running many, many years later, providing lots of economic activity. If you consider the broad principles of CEV, um, the CBC model can be understood as part of that of that CEV approach. Um, they talk about being long term. Well, establishing a business um, is a long term endeavor. It's not something you do for a week or two. It's usually a career choice or a um, you know something that people want to do with their with their lives. The variety of businesses talk about the broad objectives um, within the community that uh, you've had various adjustment programs that have been made available um, under the CBC model over the years. Um, unlike other government initiatives, the CBC program actually targets all sectors of the economy. So you deal with the retail sector, service sector, uh, manufacturing, processing, uh, put it another way, it deals with both primary industry, secondary industry, and that third level territory uh, sectors of the economy. It has a good cross section of people that's involved with it, particularly on its board of directors. And the notion there is that, that uh, those folks that are from the local community know the community best. They provide a good cross section of what's in the best interest of the community. They also talk about empowering uh, people and self-reliance. When you look at self-employment, that really all is about uh, empowerment and self-reliance. Those folks have decided to take the risk, to take a chance of going into business for themselves, and it really speaks to that uh, empowerment and, and self-reliance. The broad distribution of benefits is another characteristics of CED, and many of the businesses that, that uh, have been supported provide goods or services to the, to the uh, local community uh, and to the broader population of the, uh, of the community. It's comprehensive in the sense that CBCs touch all parts of the community. It's economic through the shops and the boutiques and the other kind of uh, economic drivers, whether it's manufacturing or processing. It's cultural in terms of the work that CBCs do, helping out with, uh, particularly with social enterprise, uh, to have live theater, to have your uh, support for your rinks, to have support for your you know, facilities that you have within your, within your community. Uh, and even part of that cultural stuff is the fact that businesses in the community are often relied on to provide funds uh, to help your local parade, to help with local events that are going on with the community. So it adds to the to the, both the social and the cultural parts of the, of the economy. I want to flip now in terms of that's a bunch of the theory around uh, CED stuff, and I want to spend some time talking about the history of um, the CDC uh, model and a little bit on particular uh, with respect to, to Guy's work. So the genesis of the program, where did it come from? It really started with a pilot project uh, with 22 communities across the country in 1974-75 through Community Employment Strategy, which it was a Canada and Employment and Immigration Commission program. And uh, what it was was, again, to, to look at the situation in local communities in terms of particularly those with, with higher unemployment. It was to help with the, to assist with the plight of the unemployed and the, and the underemployed. A group of like-minded individuals within the, uh, within the, within the Gajan County area came together to form the first Community Employment Strategy Association. Part of their work really was trying to identify how do we get people back to work? What are the things that we can do? We can deal with fake work grants, we can deal with other things. They kind of shifted their attention and identified that small business development was one way to achieve some uh, long-term prosperity for the community. One of the uh, issues that they looked at in terms of you know, what's, the, what's the barriers, what's the obstacles to starting business within the, within the local community. In fact, one of the pieces that were identified very early on was access to capital was probably going to be a, going to be a problem. So in 1977, the CSA group uh, commissioned um, Dr. Neil Glant and Dr. Ian Spencer from Sandex University to prepare a, uh, a study or to do a study on the feasibility of establishing a community economic development corporation uh, within, within Guyville County. Part of that work was to, to see what the structure would be, what its mandate would be, and so on. That work uh, actually concluded in August of 1977 with a report that was provided by uh, Dr. Spencer and Gallant, and they provided um, you know, an overview and some recommendations of what could be done. And uh, that resulted in the creation of McDill. McDill is the Mulgrave Guidebook Council Development Incentives Limited, which is a local nonprofit uh, corporation. It's a non-share capital corporation with, uh, that is limited by, by guarantee. Um, so what I want to show you is, is kind of a map that we put together just in terms of, this is Atlanta, Canada. Uh, in 1975, there was one community development corporation, or one uh, business development center, if you will, that was located in, uh, in Guysville, Nova Scotia. 
Flip ahead a little bit um, to 19 uh, to the 1980s to give you a bit of a history. At that time, they were known as business development centers. There were 30 BDCs established in the 1980s. Guys were started in 1975, as I mentioned, through the Community Employment uh, Strategy, where they created McDill. The first money came uh, in 1979 under the short-lived Joe Clark government. That a check arrived in Guy's broke in November of 1979 for uh, for $400,000. In the spring, there was another $100,000 provided. Um, just as a way of a little note, the interest earnings at that time, I think the money was parked in the in the Royal Bank or the Bank of Montreal and Canso, earning 18% interest on that on that money at the time. So times have changed. Anyway, the minister responsible at the time was Elmer McKay. Peter McKay's father was the minister of Dree at the time, and that's uh, the money came through in 1979. The Community Futures Program was established as a new program in 1986. I should back up for a second. 75 was the establishment of Guy's Grove. 81 was the next onslaught of BDCs that were established. That you had one that was established in Buckton, in Brunswick, one that was established in Grand Falls. Uh, Newfoundland and one that was established in uh, Alberton PEI and then you've seen some more in uh, 84 and so on. Uh, 80, 1986 was the establishment of the Community Future Program under the Canada Job Strategy. It was built on the successes of the previous corporations. You see that more from Community Employment Strategy to what they call leader corporations uh, and then on to lead corporations and then finally in 1986 went on to the uh, Community Future Program. And it really was an evolution that took place over a period of time to kind of build on the best practices of each one of those uh, development corporations. Um, to show the map in terms of 1981, you see uh, where there's some more CBC showing up on the map. Um, then 1984, uh, you see the map slowly filling in, 1985, 1986, 87, 88, 89. Um, so you basically see how, how the uh, Atlantic Cabinet is being better served through the, through the Community Future Program. We move into the 1990s. Uh, there were 10 more CBCs that were established um, at that at that time. Lloyd Axworthy, who's the minister of HRDC at the time, felt that the community future program probably didn't align well with uh, human resources development. He felt that that probably should fit more with business development, and uh, there was a transfer of responsibility from HRDC over to Industry Canada. Industry Canada uh, at the time basically had regional development agencies. So in Atlanta, Canada, the program fell under the jurisdiction of ACOA. In uh, Quebec, it fell under SEDQ. Under Ontario, or Northern Ontario, it came out under FEDNOR. And in Western Canada, under Western Economic Diversification. The um, business development centers changed their names to community business development corporations. Uh, one main reason they changed their name was because the Business Development Bank had just changed their name from Federal Business Development Bank. They were now considered BDC, so you had the kind of like a big, a big BDC and a small BDC. Uh, so we wanted to kind of differentiate ourselves from the Business Development Bank and change our name to Community Business Development Corporation because that's really more what we did as opposed to the uh, straight business development. Um, universal coverage was initiated. When ACOA took over responsibility in 1995, they wanted to see universal coverage. Prior to that, you could only have a business development center or that function within a defined community futures area. And to be a community futures area, you had to meet certain criteria around uh, unemployment and, uh, and so on. So uh, areas, for example, like Anaconish, Nova Scotia, or Toronto, Nova Scotia, or Lunenburg were not covered under the program. Uh, once ACOA took over, they wanted to have universal coverage to make sure that it was applied in all, all rural regions of Atlanta, Canada. Um, and also during the 1990s was the establishment of the Nova Scotia, the New Brunswick, the Newfoundland, the Labrador uh, associate, principal associations of uh, CBDCs. I should back up in 1988, the Eastern Canadian, of, Eastern Canadian Association of Business Development Centers was formed. Uh, that is the present day Atlantic Association of CBDCs. Continuing on with the history of, of the 1990s, that Really, from that period of 1995 to 2000, self-sufficiency dominated the discussions. And really what happened is that when ACOA inherited responsibility for the program, they didn't understand what the BDCs did. Uh, they weren't sure what they did, so they, they felt at the time the best thing to do was to make them self-sufficient. Um, and uh, so there was a, a lot of turmoil within the relationship for the first number of years that we started with, a, with ACOA. Um, coming close to 1999, 2000, uh, there was a recognition that the value uh, that was being brought to bear from the CDCs actually was worth keeping. Um, so the whole idea of self-sufficiency 
was pushed off the track. Um, during that period of 95 to 99, they hired a gentleman by the name of Jacques Michel, who was a former vice president of the Business Development Bank, um, to look at self-sufficiency models. So they looked at you know, what it would take in order to get each one of these corporations self-sufficient. There were two CBDCs at the time that declared self-sufficiency, both of them were in Prince Edward Island, East Prince Development and West, West Prince Ventures. Also during that period of time was a new program that was launched in 1997. Uh, it was called the UC Connection Program, uh, UC Connection Capital Program. And uh, it was a targeted program towards youth entrepreneurship between youth between 18 and 29 years of age. They could borrow uh, up to $15,000 in unsecured money. Um, and uh, there was also a training component that was uh, available to youth to help them get their, get their business started. <coughs> Excuse me, the, the lending limit of CDCs increased. When it first started out in 1979, the lending limit was $25,000. And then when the Community Future Program came around in 86, it was at $75,000. Um, and then uh, during uh, 1995, it went to $125,000. So the lending limit increased in recognition of the, of the demands that are being placed by the uh, clients on CBCs. At the same time that government was putting money into the seed capital program, uh, there was a reluctance to put money, more money into the general uh, investment side of the, of the CBCs. From a government perspective, looking at the overall program, they seen 41 corporations in Atlanta, Canada. Now, we had a situation where we had some corporations that had funds surplus to their immediate needs in their bank accounts, while we had others that did not have enough money to meet the demands for clients. So uh, COA, uh, in particular, uh, basically didn't want to provide any more money until uh, we come up with uh, what was determined to be better asset management. So they wanted us to pursue an asset management model. There was a model that was developed in Ontario um, uh, with respect to asset management. And they, uh, we looked at it here in Atlanta, Canada but it didn't really fit our needs, so essentially we, uh, we, developed our, uh, we developed our own. So I want to talk a bit about, uh, show you a few more slides, uh, the, how you see the map filling in, 1990, 1991, 92, 94, 95, really was the last year that any of the uh, CBCs were incorporated. So we have now 41 CBCs across Atlanta, Canada. The youngest is 17 years old and the oldest is 37. And we have them in between. The average age of the CBCs today is 24.5 year, years. So as we go on to uh, moving ahead to the year 2000, 2006, I touched on the development of the central credit facility. And really what that was, was, uh, as I mentioned, it's a, it's kind of a central pool that was made, uh, was put together, so that those that had money surplus of needs could lend to it. So it provided them a, an additional investment vehicle. It also provided those that needed to borrow money a place they go to to get low cost, uh, low cost capital. It started really with the initial capitalization for the pool came from the 41 CBCs. Each of them were asked to uh, provide $37,500 uh, to the, uh, the new central fund, and it would be a way of a loan that they would lend money to the fund, but the loan would be for 10 years and it would be non interest bearing. And so it was the closest thing we could get to having share capital um, and equity contributions by the, by the CBCs. So that 37,500 times 41 gives about a million and a half dollars in this capitalization. We then went to a co-op, asked them for money to augment uh, the money that was put into the pool. And over the next three years, they provided $15.5 million uh, to the fund. And the fund today is, is actually uh, a $30 million fund um, that's operating very well. During that same period of time, uh, a gentleman by the name of Peter Goff was retained to look at the annual operating expenses for delivery of the program. And what he found as part of his work is that uh, while ACOA does support the work that's being done by CDCs, it doesn't provide 100% of the funding. In fact, what he found is that 48% of the funding came from ACOA to look after the heat, the lights, and the wages, and so on. And a full 52% came from uh, other sources. So it may be fees for service that the CDCs are delivering other activities that they receive money for. Uh, there was a suggestion at the time that increases in operating funding should be considered. There was some that was uh, that was done. Earlier, I alluded to the fact of access to capital being problematic back in the 70s and back in the 80s. Um, it still persists today. Um, in 2002, a gentleman by the name of Ray Falkins was retained by ACOA to study the changing banking uh, habits or trends, uh, environment, I should say, in Atlanta, Canada. And what he found at that time, within the preceding uh, uh, 10 years, that 
16% of the branch, bank branch network closed across Atlantic Canada. And within Newfoundland, it's much more pronounced. So 23% of that branch network was closed. So you've seen in rural communities where, in fact, access to capital is difficult to come by with the banks that are there. And also you've seen a, a pulling out or retraction of the banks in those, in those rural communities, just complicating the situation with access to capital even further. This program has gone through numerous studies, evaluations, and so on that have been done over the years. Uh, Goss Gilroy did one in 2003. There was another one done in 2005. There were other studies done in 2009. Every one of those have uh, remarked about the uh, program in terms of its value for money, with the benefits that it provides to, uh, to communities and so on. There's also been official language audits done. Um, there's been audits of each one of the, uh, the CF program as well as the, the C program. The two CBCs I talked about earlier um, had declared self-sufficiency. They were self-sufficient for 10 years. They come back into the fold, if you will, and started taking operating funding in the mid-1990s. One of the interesting um, things about the CBCs is a report that was done by the Auditor General in 2001. And when the Auditor General's people came in to review the CBC file, they found that there was good value for money. And one of the things that they noted was that uh, four percent of a COAS budget was allocated or dedicated to the Community Future Program. That four percent allocation, which at the time was about ten million dollars, <coughs> actually represented thirty-two percent of the numbers that a COAS was reporting in terms of job creation within Atlantic Canada. So the value for money was quite pronounced for the work being done by the CBCs. That just looked at the operating side, and there was some confusion at the time: is why can you actually take four percent of your budget and produce thirty-two percent of the numbers? Well, what had to be discussed and explained was the fact that you had a revolving loan fund. The money was being lent all the time, so the $10.6 million that was used at the time was to pay heat, lights, and wages kind of thing, and the activity within the investment fund actually was generating those 32% 32, uh, of the numbers. One of the arguments has always been within the, within the CBC network is about who owns the money. The money was provided to the communities by way of grants and contributions, can government come back and claw back that money at some point in the future? And the other general in her report um, noted that COA can adjust the operating funding that it provides the CDC, but it doesn't have the power to recover funds that were previously provided. <coughs> to continue on with the history, um, we, sh we talk about uh, the provincial associations being established in three provinces. Uh, PEI joined that, and they established an association in the, uh, in the early 2000s. We also had a um, dedicated program that was established in 2003 called the Women in Business Initiative. And um, it provided um, resources to female entrepreneurs that wanted to start a business or that were in business. It was recognized by studies that women face different barriers uh, to business. And typically, those barriers are lack of equity and lack of security. So a program was put in place to encourage CBCs to lend uh, to women entrepreneurs. So you have an access to finance to peace. There was also a piece around consulting advisory so that if a female entrepreneur needed help with business, support, uh, business management skills training, like understanding accounting, understanding human resources and so on, that was available through the program. We also established another targeted program to technology where um, if somebody was tinkering in the basement with some kind of widget that they were making, they wanted to commercialize that, uh, we could in fact help them uh, by lending them some money and providing some technical support. Um, it was also made available for adoption of technology. So those uh, businesses in the land of Canada that um, you know, were operating the business but new technology came along, this fund actually helped them to adopt some of that new technology. An interesting piece uh, started really was formalized in 2005 in that the new terms and conditions in October 2005 allowed lending to social enterprises. It's the first time that there was a formal recognition with the government of Canada that the social economy provides uh, value and it really should be supported. So that was entrenched within the Community Futures Program Terms and Conditions in 2005. Interesting enough that in Guy's world, they were doing that probably for a minimum of, of 10 years before it became eligible uh, within, the, within the federal program. The lending limits were also increased to $150,000 uh, in 2005. Uh, there were new terms and conditions that were devised in uh, 2010 that will run us for another, for another five years. I'm going to switch now from the history and talk about what's going on uh, today. Uh, I mentioned previously that there are 41 CBCs delivering the Community Future Program in rural Atlanta, Canada. We have 283 employees, 415 volunteers. That each one of these individual corporations are governed by a volunteer board of directors that are drawn from local communities. And uh, the competencies and skill sets 
um, range from those that are in business, those that are community activists, those that are in education, so there's a broad, uh, broad swath of people that are involved in that volunteer sector. There's about 25 people within a co-op that uh, are assigned to the Community Futures file. The CBCs don't just deliver that access to financing piece. They also provide uh, or deliver the self-employment benefit program pretty much universally across the 41. They also provide, in many cases, employment assistance services, uh, programs like the Older Workers Program, uh, Department of Community Services pro pilot projects that have been started in various uh, jurisdictions. There are micro loans that are provided by uh, some of the CBCs. And in at least two provinces, uh, we have student and business programs uh, and loans that are available for um, youth that are still attending either uh, high school or uh, even elementary school for that matter. The government of Canada provided $130 million of investment capital to these CBCs since they started. $95 million was given directly to the CBCs um, over a um, period from 1979 until today. Um, in addition to that $95 million, they gave $15 million to the central fund, so you add that to it. Plus, um, over the last couple of years, there was a transition on the seed capital program from debt to equity, uh, which brought another $20,000 to, uh, to the overall pool. So, in essence, Government Canada provided $130 million to this program. It, it has um, now collectively over $700 million has been lent uh, to the small business community in Atlantic Canada. The active fund that I talked about before, that central fund, is functioning uh, very well. Uh, there are no major complications with that. Today, or March 31st, 2012, we had 6,500 loan clients uh, across Atlantic Canada. Uh, $232 million in loans outstanding to, uh, to clients. In total, um, the CBCs were administering $270 million in, uh, in assets uh, that have under administration. We did some work a couple of years ago trying to refashion or, or, or reconfigure uh, the way that the funding was allocated to the CBCs. Currently, there's $12.6 million of federal money that goes into the Community Future Program, Community Future Program in Atlantic Canada. That's to be spread across the 41 and do all the things that we want to do. Um, there was some work to, to, to retool the way that was done. There was actually a formula that was brought in um, on the operating side, and, and the formula is defined basically by two key principles. One is uh, based on performance, the second is based on need. So the model goes like this, that the better a CBC performs, the more eligible they are to receive operating funding. They'll receive that operating funding if, in fact, they have a demonstrated need for that. And need is defined uh, in terms of um, if a CBC has a lot of cash sitting in the bank, then there's an expectation they can use some of that cash to pay for some of their heat and lights and wages and so on. The second part of that on the need side is that if a CBC is generating a good return on their investment, then they should use or they're expected to use part of that to uh, help pay for the heat and lights of the, of the corporation. A couple other things that we did as part of that, that retooling and, uh, of Community Futures of Tomorrow is that um, as we're going through that exercise, one of the things that we heard from our members was that uh, there is a need for training uh, and that better trained entrepreneurs make for a healthier business community, which makes for a stronger portfolio. So we established an entrepreneurial training fund so that clients could actually avail of business management skills training to help them run their businesses better. On the back end of that, we created another tool called the Risk Mitigation Fund. So uh, in the event that a loan went bad, we provided the default mechanism where the CBC could be reimbursed for a portion of the losses. So what we tried to do, although we changed the funding model and made it a bit more rigid for CBCs to operate, we also provided some additional support by way of, on the front end of the loan, helping with the entrepreneurial training fund and on the back end with a Risk Mitigation Fund. Some of the other things that we did in terms of uh, collaborative work that uh, 41 CBCs now have consistent branding um, that we produce uh, TV commercials to have a marketing communication division within the association to help out with that. The active subscription uh, notion of creating that central fund back in, in 2000 really was a watershed moment for the CBCs. It provided the glue or the, or the necessary ingredient to provide a more cohesive environment for the CBCs. We've been uh, very much involved with strategic planning that we, uh, we think is a very important part of, of growth and development. That we had our first strategic plan in 2002 that ran for a five year period. We developed another one in 2007 that took us to 2012. Uh, just last week, as a matter of fact, we just let a contract for the next round of strategic planning for the next three years um, take us up to 2015. 
We have common software uh, that each one of these corporations, uh, as I mentioned before, we've got 6,501 clients across the, uh, across the four bank provinces. That's a fair bit of administration and a fair bit of loan files to look after. So we purchased software a number of years ago uh, and then uh, made it available to our 41 corporations. We went the next step and we made that available in a centralized environment. So the software itself resides on a server sitting in the, uh, at, at the Atlantic Technology Center in Charlottetown, PEI, and the 41 corporations access that using the, uh, the internet. So it's a bit progressive with respect to that. That's now been replicated in Ontario and it's starting to move to, uh, to Western Canada. We have pro, uh, common program delivery with the Women in Business Initiative, with the Technology Development Fund, and some of the personal development that we do. The uh, last piece on here is, is in relation to coordination and avoids of overlap and duplication. Because we have uh, kind of a, a local, uh, the local CBCs, then you have provincial associations, you have the Atlantic Association, and you have the National Association, you always need to be careful of overlap and duplication, and we try to coordinate some of those pieces of work as we, as we go along. In terms of challenges and opportunities, the biggest challenge that we see is the shifting priorities of government. That represents both the challenge and opportunity. A specific one uh, to talk about recently is the demise of the federal funding for the regional development authorities in Atlantic Canada. That provides both uh, a challenge in terms of who does that piece of work now within the local community. It also provides an opportunity that maybe there's some opportunities for the CDC to enhance their presence um, uh, along the lines of business support. The big, other big opportunity that we see um, is uh, in terms of the CBCs have a large footprint in rural Atlantic Canada. That we have offices across, and we have 41 corporations, and at last count we had 73 locations that we served. So while they had 41, you had satellite offices and so on that served. Well, Canada. that's a big footprint to have in rural Atlantic Canada. The other part of that is that the CBCs have a legal framework where it represents an opportunity or a vehicle to do a lot of other things because the legal framework is already in place. It makes it much easier to contract with uh, whether it's a government department, whether it's a private sector. The mandate's there, the legal framework's there, so it provides uh, significant opportunities. In terms of a, of a sector analysis, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, uh, but there are a lot of players within uh, the small business development uh, field. <clears throat> and the biggest one that's most recognizable is the Business Development Bank of Canada. They do a, a fair bit of work with small business, but really where their threshold starts is at $250,000 and above. With the CBCs, our maximum loan is $150,000, and in fact the average loan is forty five dollars to $46,000. So really, uh, we work on a collaborative basis, on a collaborative basis with the folks at BDC, uh, providing referrals to them, we're actually doing some of the due, due diligence around the loan files, and then uh, we actually have a, there's a pilot project in Quebec where the uh, CFTC in those provinces, in that province, can actually uh, adjudicate the loan request, make a decision, and the folks at, at uh, BDC will sign off on the, on the loan. Charter banks also provide some access to capital, but it's, it's long been noted that there's some gaps within the funding that charter banks provide. They pulled out of rural communities. Um, it's now more of a head office environment, so if you want a loan at a local branch, you provide the information to the local branch, and it's based on uh, decisions based on folks in some regional office somewhere they're looking at formulas and so on. Credit unions, case populaires, provide some business uh, financing, but it's spotty uh, in terms of not all credit unions have the capacity to deal with commercial loans. Um, the province of Nova Scotia have a, a loan guarantee program of, of up to $150,000 that the credit union system looks after. But it's not available in all credit unions because they don't have the capacity within those branches to deal with that. So there's some gaps within that. The Canada um, Canadian Youth Business Foundation provides uh, loans to youth, uh, uh, but again, it's a bit spotty in terms of its effect and its reach. Uh, that they do a lot of times through third-party delivery agents. Uh, so it's a long, arduous process. They do have a mentoring component as part of that, um, but um, the results are not always the greatest. You have departments like ACOA and ECBC um, that provide funding to business, but for the most part, their restrictions, they're restricted to manufacturing, processing, and some degree tourism. They don't touch service, they don't touch retail. There's many things that are prohibited, and usually they're looking for the larger clients, uh, much larger than us. You have uh, programs that are issued Canada, you have other non-government organizations that provide some uh, that provide some funding as well. But by and large, the CBCs do a much better job of uh, providing that support 
in rural communities. The last thing I want to talk about is scalability in terms of uh, this model was created in 1975 and there's always that challenge when you're doing a community economic development project is it scalable? Can you build it? Can you replicate it someplace else? Well, there's a lot of evidence that this, this model has worked and worked very well. In fact, we started one corporation in 1975. We're now 269 across the country. Uh, and the uh, total assets under administration now are approaching $1 billion uh, with those 269 corporations. That, uh, some other examples that where this uh, model has been replicated is with the Black Business Initiative. That they actually have the equivalent of the CBDC serving the, uh, the black community. Um, as well as uh, Metro Business Opportunities in Newfoundland and St. John's. It's an urban um, uh, project uh, that provides business support and access to financing for those folks within St. John's. So scalability, the evidence is there that, it's, that it is doable and that it works, uh, it works very well. I want to conclude by saying that the CDCs have a, an excellent model of um, uh, helping out communities and uh, they don't have the answers to all of the woes of rural communities, but uh, they, uh, they provide a very good uh, resource for communities in rural Atlanta, Canada. Thank you. Done.